bearings are not excluded from this premise. Unfortunately, many bearings fail prematurely due to several reasons related with poor maintenance practices. What is your experience of bearing failure in your plant? SKF experience suggests that, generally speaking, about half of those premature failures are typically related with poor lubrication or contamination. These figures do vary from industry to industry. But what is meant by poor lubrication? Poor lubrication practices include applying an unsuitable lubricant, inadequate quantities of lubricant, failure to follow the required re-lubrication intervals. Moreover, bear in mind that often, once the bearing has been properly installed and sealed, the only contact that it will have with the exterior will be by means of any lubricant that may be added from time to time. Therefore, providing clean and cool lubricant is another key element of a maintenance program if the lifespan of a machine component is to be maximized. Improper re-lubrication practices can also destroy seals, allowing the ingress of external contaminants. Based on these facts, and on the data presented on the previous slide, we could therefore say that with a proper lubrication program in place, we could help to control about half of premature bearing failures. Our e-learning course, Introduction to Lubrication Management, offers more information about what a good lubrication management program should encompass. Friction can be defined as the force resisting the relative motion of two bodies. Many parts of a machine actually rely on friction for their operation, for example brakes, clutches, belt drives and even fasteners such as the nuts and bolts which hold the machine together. In many other machinery parts however, friction is undesirable since it can create heat, wear and increased energy consumption. Minimizing friction between moving parts is a primary function of a bearing. However, in order to achieve longer life and lower energy consumption, friction within the bearing has to be minimized. This is the main objective of a bearing lubricant, thereby minimizing wear. Additional functions of lubricants are protection against corrosion, sealing against external media, and cooling, as in the case of oils. A lubricant can be considered as a stack of layers which will slide as a relative movement between the surfaces takes place. Viscosity is a measure of the internal friction between these layers. Viscosity is often thought of as the resistance of a given fluid to flow. This is easily understood by comparing, for example, what happens when we try to pour honey with what happens when we try to pour wine. Dynamic viscosity is determined by measuring the resistance to flow. The measurement unit for dynamic viscosity is the poise, P, named after scientist Jean Poisouy. It is more commonly expressed in terms of centipoise, or CP, this being equal to the SI multiple millipascal seconds, or MPAS. By dividing the dynamic viscosity of a fluid by the density of the fluid, the kinematic viscosity value is found. This is the measurement that is used for commercial purposes in order to characterize a lubricant. The measurement unit for kinematic viscosity is the Stokes, ST, named after George Gabriel Stokes. It is more commonly expressed in terms of centistokes, CST, or in terms of millimeters squared per second. One CST equals one millimeter squared per second.
ISO has defined a series of standard ranges for viscosity, as defined in the table shown here. An ISO VG, viscosity grade, is defined by a midpoint with a possible deviation of 10%. For example, ISO VG100 denotes an oil that has a kinematic viscosity of 100 CST, plus or minus 10% at 40 degrees Celsius. In other words, the viscosity is in the range 90 CST to 100 CST. Note that an oil of, for example, 85 CST may exist, but there is no ISO classification for such a lubricant. As a general rule, low viscosities are used for high speeds, low temperatures and low pressures, while high viscosities applied for opposite conditions. From an application point of view, lighter oils, normally up to VG22, are used for pneumatic applications. Higher viscosities, traditionally between VG32 and VG68, for hydraulic systems. ISO VG100 and VG150 are commonly found in circulation systems, while viscosities between VG220 and VG680 are found in gear applications. Heavier viscosities can be found in, for example, open gear applications. Although ISO aims to provide a standard scale for viscosity measurement, several other scales are also used, and this table presents a comparison between some of them. Notably, SAE scales are specially meant for automotive applications, while AGMA ones have been designed for gear applications. Click on the download icon to obtain a copy of the comparison chart for future reference. Viscosity is affected by several factors, like load, aging or stress. However, for practical applications, the most relevant variable is temperature. The degree by which viscosity reduces as the temperature rises is assessed by means of the viscosity index, or VI. This is calculated by means of measuring the viscosity at 40 degrees Celsius and 100 degrees Celsius. In the example shown here, two ISO VG100 oils with different viscosity index are compared. Although at 40 degrees Celsius the viscosity is the same, at 100 degrees Celsius the oil with a viscosity index of 135 reports a higher value compared with the oil having a viscosity index of 95. To understand the characteristics of friction in a little more details, consider what happens as a plane bearing starts from standstill and gradually increases in speed. The graph shown is commonly known as a Strybeck curve and illustrates the types of friction present on that plane bearing as it increases in speed. On the vertical axis, the friction value is represented in a logarithmic scale, while on the horizontal axis, a parameter that combines speed, viscosity and pressure is shown. With a given viscosity and pressure, as the speed increases, the friction starts at a high value in a condition known as boundary friction, which is characterized by the entwining of the asperities of the surfaces in contact. Rather quickly though, the surfaces start to separate from each other by means of the lubricant, creating a condition known as mixed friction. Later on, when the two surfaces are completely separated, the minimum friction value is achieved. This is the start of a condition known as fluid friction. Under such condition, the surfaces are no longer in contact. However, a given amount of friction arises from the internal resistance of the fluid separating the surfaces. Such resistance could be identified with what we know as viscosity. The ideal working condition would be somewhere after the minimum friction point. The reason for choosing such point is simply to provide additional protection to the surfaces in case of, for example, overload, in order to avoid falling back into the mixed friction zone. Still thinking of the Strybeck curve, consider now what happens if speed and pressure remain constant but the viscosity varies. At a given speed, the viscosity required to achieve the minimum friction point, that is provide complete surface separation, is known as the required viscosity. This is normally identified as V1. The ratio between the actual viscosity, or V, and the required viscosity, V1, is known as the kappa value.
General rules state that the kappa value should fall in the range of 1 and up to 4. Values higher than 4 provide no extra benefit and could rather generate high temperature due to the excess of fluid friction inside the lubricant. Some applications, normally related with slow rotation or oscillating movements, cannot always achieve a kappa value over 1. Under such conditions, the formulation of the grease and its additive package are crucial to ensure a proper lubrication condition. Lubrication mechanism in rolling bearings is slightly different from plain bearings. Consider what happens in a ball bearing when a ball reaches the load zone. Both the element and the race get deformed, creating an elliptical area of contact. As the surface is flattened, a high pressure zone is created where the lubricant is compressed. What effect do you think this compression has on the viscosity of the lubricant? Grease production is a delicate business. The image shows two greases that, although having used identical formulations, had different production conditions, leading to completely different products. While one process generated an NLGI2 grease, the other one led to an NLGI00. Likewise, other properties like corrosion protection or re-lubrication intervals are affected depending on the raw materials and process used. The conclusion is clear. Although two greases might report similar formulations, their performance is not necessarily the same. How then to decide between two different greases that look alike? When choosing a grease for a bearing application, it is very important to select a grease which has characteristics appropriate to the operating conditions to which the grease will be subjected. Greases can be characterized in a number of ways, some of which are shown here. Click each icon to learn more about each of these and how these properties are assessed. Mechanical stability is the structural stiffness of a grease when submitted to load and impact. The consistency of a grease will change when the grease starts to work. If the consistency doesn't change much when working, then the grease is said to have a good mechanical stability. A basic test performed to measure this is the prolonged penetration test in which a grease sample is subjected to 100,000 double strokes in a device called a grease worker and then its consistency is measured again. The lower the change, the more mechanically stable is the grease. This characteristic is crucial when selecting greases for many applications, for example vibrating machinery. SKF performs additional tests to assess the characteristics of the grease in order to ensure its suitability for a given application. When choosing a grease for a bearing application, it is very important to select a grease which has character. Lubricating greases should protect metal surfaces from corrosive attack in the service. The corrosion protection properties of rolling bearing greases are evaluated using the SKF M-Core method, which is standardized under ISO 11007. Under this test method, a mixture of lubricating grease and distilled water is present in the bearing. The bearing alternates during a defined test cycle between standstill and rotation of 80 RPM. At the end of the test cycle, the degree of corrosion is evaluated according to a scale between 0, no corrosion, and 5, very severe corrosion. A more severe test method is to follow the standard test procedure which replaces the distilled water with salt water. In addition, the variation shown in the slide called water washout test is carried out by continuously allowing water to flow or wash through the bearing arrangement during the test cycle. This corrosion test is a useful guide for the protection provided by a lubricating grease in the event of a bearing becoming constantly contaminated with water and normally leads to the failure of greases formulated with water-soluble corrosion inhibitors. The results of water washout are believed to be significant with respect to service performance. When choosing a grease for a bearing application, it is very important to select a grease which has characteristics appropriate. In this test, the lubrication capacity of the grease under variable load, temperature and speed conditions is evaluated. Two specially designated spherical roller bearings 
22312 EWMA stroke C3P VQ420 are submitted to specific load, temperature and speed conditions. Test A. After the first 24 hours at room temperature, wear is measured. When choosing a grease for a bearing application, it is very important to select a grease which has characteristics. The SKF R0F grease test machine determines... When choosing a grease for a bearing application, it is very important. In this lesson, we learned how SKF has developed a series of performance tests in order to simulate real working conditions and to assess the capabilities of a given grease. These results, along with additional industry standards, are reported in the technical data sheets of SKF greases. In order to select a grease, four main steps have to be considered. One, Determine the temperature range under which the grease is required to work. Two, based on the speed, varying geometry and temperature, define the required viscosity of the movement. Three, based on the load conditions, select the additional characteristics required of the lubricant. Four, based on the working conditions and environment, verify compatibilities and any additional characteristic required from the grease. A given grease has an ideal working temperature range that depends on its formulation and production process. In general, at low temperatures, greases tend to become stiffer and therefore the oil released might become insufficient and the friction increases. This phenomenon is called starvation. Conversely, at high temperatures, the oil bleeding will be increased and the oxidation process of the lubricant will be accelerated. SKF has developed this traffic light concept to illustrate the behaviour of grease throughout the temperature range. The extreme temperature limits, low and high, are well defined. The low temperature limit, LTL, the lowest temperature at which a grease enables the bearing to be started up without difficulty, is largely determined by the base load and its viscosity. The high temperature limit, HTL, is determined by the type of thickener at its dropping point. The dropping point is the temperature at which a grease loses its consistency and becomes a fluid. The temperature range for reliable operation is indicated by the SKF values for the following limits. Low temperature performance limit, LTPL. High temperature performance limit, HTPL. Within these two limits, which is indicated by the green zone, the grease fulfills its function reliably and the re-lubrication interval on grease life can be determined accurately. Since the definition of the high temperature performance limit is not standardised internationally, care must be taken when interpreting supply and data. SKF does not recommend using a grease above or below its temperature limits in the red zones to lubricate areas. At temperatures above the high temperature performance limit, or HTPL, grease degrades with increasing rapidity and the byproducts of oxidation have a detrimental effect on the lubricant. Therefore, temperatures in the amber zone between the high temperature performance limit, HTPL, and the high temperature limit, HTL, should only be allowed to occur for very short periods and not longer than a few hours. An amber zone also exists for low temperatures. With decreasing temperature, the consistency or stiffness of grease increases and the tendency of grease to bleed decreases. This ultimately leads to an insufficient supply of lubricant reaching the contact surfaces of the rolling elements and raceways. This temperature limit is indicated by the Low Temperature Performance Limit, or LTPL. Values for the Low Temperature Performance Limit are different for roller bearings than for ball bearings. Since ball bearings are easier to lubricate than roller bearings, the Low Temperature Performance Limit is less important for ball bearings. For roller bearings, however, serious damage can result when the bearings are operated continuously below this limit. Short periods in this zone, such as during a cold start, are not harmful because the heat caused by friction brings the bearing temperature into the green zone. 